Christ is risen. Christ is in me. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to Luke. And since it is the gospel reading, I ask that you stand as you are able, in body or in spirit. Listen for the word of the Lord. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, that is, the women. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified. And on the third day, rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. You may be seated. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out today. This is great. If you're here for the first Sunday, uh, we are honored to have you. And I hope that there's something that will bless you today. If you've been coming for 40 years, uh, please know how much we appreciate all you do. And uh, if you thought you were going out to brunch and somebody drug you in here, we'll be done in a few more minutes. So don't worry about it, okay? (laughs) That can happen, can it? When you're visiting people, you're just like, what am I doing here? So if you don't know why you're here, welcome for sure. I want to thank the choir and Kevin. Thank you so much. And John. And the Easter Brass, you guys are great. And don't forget the percussion session, right in the back. Man, if you got the timpanis out, you got church, let me tell you that right now. All right. Well, um, in the springtime of 1969, Now, for you young people, that sounds like a long time ago, and it is, but nevertheless, in the springtime of 1969, something odd was happening in the house that I lived in with my mother and father because my parents were acting weird. Now, most 16-year-olds know parents act weird, but this was uniquely weird. And I'll tell you what they were doing. They were having little meetings between the two of them, and they would whisper. And we had like an 800 square foot house, so a private place to have a conversation was hard to find. But they would have these little meetings and they'd be whispering there. And when I would walk in the room, they would jerk their heads and just stop talking. And this went on and on and on and on. And I didn't know what was going on. I was conjuring up all kinds of horrible thoughts like, had my father lost his job? Did my mother have cancer? My brother was a grown man with a wife and children. And I wondered if something was wrong with those kids. And I just, when I was just conjuring up all these horrible things. But eventually they stopped their conversations and they got ready to tell me what they were talking about. And I want to tell you, friends, it was a lot worse than I could even imagine. Because they sat me down, and my father spoke for the two of them. And he said this, Kurt, your mother and I have decided that you need a summer job. (laughs) A lot worse than I imagined. 
Oh my goodness. They got, got I guess they got tired of me moping around the house. You know, it was the 60s. I kind of had long hair and I had no uh, visible interest and I was trying to find life wisdom from the uh, words of rock and roll music that I played really loud. And I guess they just got tired of it. So they decided I needed a job, but there was a problem, which was no doubt part of the discussion, that I had no marketable skills at all and no motivation. So who in their right mind would hire me? That was a good question, but my, my parents were kind of influential in kind of a middle-classy sort of way. You know, they had a lot of friends and they were in clubs and so they knew people. And I guess, you know, it was before the internet, I guess the phone information went out. Can someone hire our son? Well, nobody picked up on that offer except uh, their one lifetime friend, Jean Straubey. And uh, she worked as a secretary at Bell Fountain Cemetery, which is on West Florissen. It's 360 acres of grass. And Jean let my parents know that they hired seasonal workers to help keep up with the grass in the height of the growing season. And both Jean and my parents decided that even I could push a lawnmower. <laughs> Which I did. It was horrible. <laughs> Eight hours a day pushing a lawnmower up and down the hills. If you've ever been to Belfont Cemetery, it's a huge place pushing a lawnmower, and uh, one day it was 100 degrees, and I realized my parents no longer loved me. <laughs> and another day it was 100 degrees and 100% um, 100, 100 humidity, and then I realized they were trying to kill me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what happened. But I didn't die. I showed them. But I did learn a lot in the cemetery, other than, you know, getting up at 7.30 in the morning, which was a shock. And now, I'm sorry, work started at 7.30 in the morning. Um, it was a cut in grass there. You know, I had never been in, a, you know, a, like a funeral. I had never attended a funeral. And there were 87,000 people buried in the cemetery. And for that summer, that's who I hung out with which changes your perspective on life, believe me. And every day in that cemetery, it was a huge cemetery, every day they had a funeral. And like I said, I'd never been to a funeral, and I certainly had never gone to the part of the funeral that's at the cemetery. And the only training you got as a cemetery employee was when there was a funeral going on and you were cutting grass, you were supposed to turn your lawnmower off so you wouldn't you know, make noise right where the service was going on. And so you would turn that lawnmower off and it would just be so quiet in there. And you could hear the pastor saying, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And I never had heard that before, really, in real time. I was like, whoa, that's pretty powerful stuff. And um, at the end of the service, the people would go back to their cars. We hadn't started cutting grass yet. It was still this quiet and you could hear the people talking as they went back to their cars. And let me tell you, friends, if you want to be an invisible person, be a cemetery worker, because nobody knows you're there. And I would listen in on these conversations about people who were leaving a, fu a funeral, because I'd never attended one. And some people were very sad and grieving. And uh, some people had uh, a real religious experience, it seemed, that they, they were sure that their loved one had gone into being the eternal arms of Jesus. But the thing that shocked me, and you'd be surprised to hear how many, what percentage this is, I don't know exactly, <clears throat> about how many people were just happy that the person was dead. <laughs> now you'd be shocked by this, but let me tell you, it's true. Not they're happy that their suffering's over, not happy that they're with Jesus, just happy they're gone. And that stunned me as a 16-year-old. And I thought, is it possible to live your entire life and come to the cemetery, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and 
not have done anything in your life, either positively trying to help or maybe prevent something, having no one be sad that you were gone. And I thought to myself, I need to figure out how you don't end up that way at 16. Like I said, I had eight hours a day with the lawnmower, so I had a lot of time to think about it. And that was the first thing that I was thinking about in the cemetery. And the first time I thought about the meaning of life and, and how you should live it. I want you to know that I got a promotion that summer. Yes, I did. Must have shown great aptitude at that grass cutting job. I was promoted to tomb sweeper. This is a real job. <clears throat> well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta sweep out the tombs. And here's the first tomb I swept out. Yeah, that's a tomb. That's uh, the Bush tomb, Adolphus Bush, and his wife, who was an Anheuser. Uh, Anheuser. You see how that worked together? And there's the inside of it where I swept. It's where they were laid in rest there. That mausoleum cost $240,000 in the turn of the 19th century. And now, in present days, that would be $5 million. So I had to think a little bit about that. And about you would pour money into something like that. But on the outside, you can't really see it, but right above the gates there, the doors, there is in Latin the words, veni, vidi, vici. And uh, I don't know how I know what that meant when I was 16. Some teacher at Riverview Gardens High School had driven that into my mind. And they must have done a good job because I wasn't that good of a student. But veni, vidi, vici means I came, I saw, I conquered. First spoken by Julius Caesar as he won some battle. And I thought to myself, that is the oddest thing to put on your tomb. I mean, it's like putting on your tombstone, right? Like you ever think of like what your epitaph's gonna be, you know? Is that a good life philosophy? I mean, you can think about it, you don't have to answer. I came, I saw, I conquered. Is that how you wanna live your life? I came, I saw, I conquered. And I remembered in there sweeping, you know, I was sweeping right on where these people were interred. I remember thinking, well, I know one thing they didn't conquer. <laughs> because they're right there. <clears throat> so I thought about that while I was, you know, working the cemetery. And then I went to another tomb to work on it. And this is the Tate tomb. It's very fascinating. You can see the Egyptian influence there. Uh, it's kind of weird, though, because I don't know if the two, uh, two sphinx, sphinxes or sphinx eye, I don't know. Two sphinxes there, which are the kind of the symbol of uh, Egyptian royalty, are the Egyptian sun god. And I kind of thought that was kind of strange. And uh, people, I, I learned later, that people thought that the faces on the sphinxes looked like Mr. Tate. And here's another weird thing about it. I sure hope there's no Tates in here that are <laughs> descendants. <coughs> I, I thought about that after talking about this in the first service. And I thought, maybe I not talk about the Tates. Because obviously they were rich and influential. But he built this mausoleum in 1907 and did not die until 1934. Now, do you find that odd? Or either he was really good at preparation and being ready for stuff. Or do you think he came out and looked at it? I don't know the answer to that. The other thing about the Tate tomb that was a little bit different is regularly um, a limousine would come in, and I mean like a real limousine with a chauffeur with a hat and boots and everything, and he would park in front of the Tate tomb and he would get a lawn chair out of the back of the limo and a great big brass key and he would walk up and open those doors up and put the lawn chair in the middle of the tomb and go back to the car and get this pretty old lady and take her and put her in the tomb and set her in those chair and then the chauffeur would drive away and leave her there. And she would spend part of the day there. And I wondered what in the world was she doing there. 
she was, it was okay if you were cutting grass and saw the chauffeur put her in there. But if you didn't know that and were coming by cutting grass and somebody was sitting in there like this, it was like every horror story you had ever seen. It was like, oh my gosh. <clears throat> so I wondered, I, 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 you know, that just baffled me. Uh, it probably baffles you too. Uh, we don't, we need to put the Tates away, they're good. So, you know, I didn't want a job in the cemetery. But you know, sometimes when you don't get what you want, you get wisdom. That's true, right? So I learned four things that all cemetery workers know. The first one is, as I talked a little bit about already at the graveside funeral, like it or not, we are temporary, transitory. We're on the timer, we're on the clock, all of us, different ages. So thinking about the people that were buried there that nobody was sad about dying makes us think about how we're going to live our life, right? I mean, really need to think about that. Because we're not going to have all forever to say I love you or I'm sorry or try to make amends. It's, we're not. We think we got plenty of time, but we don't really know that, do we? So that's the first thing I know, I learned in the cemetery, uh, as a cemetery worker. The second thing I learned is that rich folks and poor folks all go to the same place. And there's another judgment that makes a difference than those two things. And the third thing that I learned, and this is important, None of those 87,000 people in that cemetery were making any new stories. They were only memories. They weren't saying, oh, did you hear what Mr. Tate did? No, he's gone. He's gone. So they're only in the past. They don't have a future. All 87,000 of them are not adding to their stories on earth. And the final thing that's so important, it's such a basic truth of cemetery work, and here it is. Once you check into Bell Fountain Cemetery, you never check out. Well, no, that's a good truth, right? That's foundational in the cemetery business. There is a fence around the cemetery. It's not to keep the 87,000 people in. It's to keep the vandals out. So I'm quite certain if I went to Bell Fountain Cemetery today, all 87,000 people that were there when I was there are still there, including the Bushes and the Tates. Nobody leaves the cemetery. Nobody. Except once in a forever. And the fact that nobody leaves the cemetery but once in a forever means that it is such an important thing that it changes our way of looking things forever. Because Jesus left the cemetery. And that's the message for today. I mean, Jesus left the cemetery. When you put it in the context of those 87,000 people who haven't, that's a, mirac a miraculous and amazing thing. Now, we know the story. We heard it read. Jesus was dead. And some women came out. They had some spices. They were on an embalming mission because that's how they kept the bodies uh, kind of preserved a little bit. They're on an embalming mission. There's a group, there was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joanna, and some other women were coming to the cemetery at daybreak, at dawn. I have been in a cemetery near dawn. And let me tell you something, friends, it is an auspicious place. Because there's a lot of tragedy and sorrow, and you can feel it. So they came to the cemetery to preserve Jesus' body. And they were grieving because Jesus was dead. And the movement they were part of was dead as well. It was all over. When they got to the tomb, the big stone that was rolled up to seal it was rolled away 
And two heavenly messengers say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Now, do you understand how that changes everything? Because the first thing that's true, remember I said that dead people don't have any future? They just have a past. That's not true of Jesus, is it? Because he's alive. And he is making new stories. And you're part of the story. And I'm part of the story. And here's the truth. Jesus is alive today, as alive today, as he was back then. And he is moving amongst us here in this sanctuary. And he is touching people's hearts. And we can feel him. He is even larger than he was because he's not located and limited by geography anymore. And Jesus Christ is alive and in the midst of his people right now. And we can feel it. And he is writing new stories. And you are all per important characters. And the second thing is, we've already talked about. Most people, when they die, stay dead. But God raised him in power. Now think about this. If God can do that, God can do anything. So I don't know if you've got some dead spots in your life, some places that you feel like you're good as dead. But let me tell you, there's a power over death and the power of God as we see in the power of Jesus who is raised from the dead. And he is where working with us all. Like I said, writing new stories every day. And finally, this is a message, some words that it's almost too amazing to try to say. But if you want to connect your life to Jesus, you want to trust in Jesus, you want to say, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. This is the mystery of the power of the Christian faith. And it is just this, that if you connect and tie yourself to Jesus, you will have the same fate as Jesus. Jesus who was born, who lived, who died, and who was raised and has eternal existence. You will, who were born and lived and will die will be raised up to eternal life with Jesus Christ. And that's the great truth and mystery of our faith. That if you tie yourself to Jesus and bind yourself to him and trust him, you will have the same fate as him. Now, That was good news from the cemetery, wasn't it? You didn't know how that was going to come out, did you? <laughs> it was good news from that summer in the cemetery. Because we learned the truth of cemetery workers. And we know that how God has defeated death in Jesus Christ. And that's good news, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and let's pray. Power of God, raise us up too and all the places where good is dead and confused and lost, all the ways we're following ideas that are just killing us. So now, Jesus, set us free, make us alive, put your spirit on us. In Jesus' name, amen.